Welcome back. Today we're going to be taking a look at kind of the final topic in our Unit 8, finally wrapping it up after it feels like months. We're talking about genetics and variation and meiosis and cell division, all kinds of crazy stuff. Today we finally get to talk about sex. Wait, oh, I finally got your attention, huh? No. Um, this uh, particular video is uh, taking a look at the outcomes of meiosis, and uh, which of course is a part of sexual reproduction, and how overall that relates to variation and variability in the species and basically the health of, of life in general. So kind of silly and some things I'm going to do in here, so I uh, don't expect that kind of conversation, uh, but it will actually talk about uh, kind of the differences between sexual and asexual reproduction, that kind of stuff. So uh, in any case, let's take a look at um, one of the benefits. First of all, what's the definition? Uh, definition of sexual reproduction is basically that process where you have haploid gametes, you better look up what those words mean, from two different individuals that come together in a process called fertilization, and that creates a new, unique, diploid individual. And at first that individual is called a zygote, but eventually a, a fetus or a baby or whatever you want to call it. But this is what the process of sexual reproduction is. Um, and sexual reproduction is wonderful. You know, Valentine's Day is coming up, it's lovely, it's romantic, but there's actually a lot of challenges to sexual reproduction as compared to asexual reproduction, like what bacteria do. So first things first, you got to find a partner. And that can present all kinds of challenges in and of itself, like this one. What happens if the partner you meet maybe isn't quite exactly what you were looking for? Fall in love with the wrong species, it's not going to end well for you. Or what if you find a partner and uh, your partner would rather eat you? That's not good. The first individual you stumble into when you're looking for a mate uh, happens to be someone that's a predator. Definitely uh, not a good idea. Or what happens if even within your own species that you do find a mate, finally meet up with someone of the opposite sex, and they want to eat you? And this actually does happen. Things like praying mantises, black widow spiders. Uh, definitely not a healthy thing. Or what if you do finally find that perfect mate, same species, opposite sex, and it looks like one of these two idiots. No guarantee, right, that the mate that you happen to find is actually something that you want to mate with. So there's a lot of challenges that go along with this. Furthermore, there's a variety of environmental challenges or other kinds of challenges as well. Uh, for example, if you're a, a really slow species, um, coming into contact with another member of your species may happen rarely. Um, there are certain species that only meet up with other individuals only to mate, and maybe only once or twice in their lives. If you have a huge territory, it could involve uh, crossing huge distances. Or like if you're this poor slow loris over here, hours, or even the snails, right? Hey, see you in an hour. No, two. No, tomorrow. What kind of suck? And finally, sorry about the picture. Um, what happens if you do come across a partner or a partner comes across you, and really things just don't mash up, you know? You're just not quite in the mood. Um, most species other than humans actually have specific breeding periods that they can be available or not. And so, you know, maybe uh, the timing just isn't quite right. All of these things are challenges for you. Plus then, what happens if you do find a partner? Sometimes those babies, man, they just don't turn out right. <laughs> these are actually all pretty healthy babies, but um, uh, this little guy is a, a bush, uh, they call it a bush baby, it's a little primate. Uh, this creature over here is actually an eye eye. It's actually what they look like, terrible looking creature, right? A couple baby birds, they always look awful. Uh, I don't know what's wrong with that dog. So, Sexual reproduction has a lot of challenges, um, just in the simple mechanics of getting together and meeting a partner. So why not asexual reproduction? What happens if, if that were a different alternative? Why don't we do that instead? It occurs in every single kingdom. Um, there are plenty of advantages to it. Um, in fact, it's still kind of out there. Uh, bacteria and archaeobacteria, they reproduce this way almost all the time. Uh, Protista, the protist kingdom, has a variety of different ways um, that they can do that. Amoeba is a really good example, one that just divides in half, but there's other ones that do that too. Uh, fungi can all reproduce um, through spores and all things like that that are not necessarily sexual. Plants, you have a variety of plants probably around your house right now, including aspen trees that primarily reproduce asexually. And there's even a variety of animals that can still do it. This little creature over here is an animal called a hydra. Uh, it's like a little predatory palm tree, almost microscopic. Um, but it's a little bud. There's a little baby. It grows right off the side. Um, bees actually reproduce asexually. All the males are produced from unfertilized eggs. So technically, it is a type of asexual reproduction. And strawberries, most common strawberries that you get, definitely. Uh, things like uh, sponges, planaria, starfish, those kinds of creatures, those guys reproduce uh, oftentimes by breaking in half. Or like a starfish, if an arm gets broken off, you can make two new starfishes. I know you've heard that about earthworms, by the way. Earthworms can't really do that. If you you know, break an earthworm into two, you get like a half an earthworm and a dead chunk. So please don't do that. 
So what would be some of the advantages to doing it asexually? Well, as I kind of joked about earlier, you don't need to find a partner, and there's none of the risks involved with doing that. You can just kind of do your own thing, you're all set, uh, no, no energy required there. Um, so again, no energy requirements either. It's, it's just you, you divide in half, you're done. Pretty much guaranteed success. Um, you, you know that if you were an individual um, that was successful, chances are pretty good that if there's two of you, that they have a good chance of being successful. Again, pretty much guaranteed success. And you know that you're going to ecologically match your environment. Genetically speaking, you have all the adaptations it took to survive this long. So two of you, you know, you and your offspring, or you're both, I don't know how they would call that. Anyway, but both of you, if you're identical now, like the two girlfriends here, um, they should be able to survive uh, just as well. So it's kind of a pretty low-risk uh, circumstance. So then why don't we always do it? And that becomes the kind of question is that asexual reproduction, on the one hand, seems pretty simple, seems like it should be an advantage, and yet sexual reproduction really is the rule of the land. Uh, and most creatures that can reproduce asexually also have ways of reproducing sexually. And so what's the key? The key's at the bottom, variation. Variation itself, the imperfectness of sexual reproduction is actually what makes it an advantage to life. The fact that all of the offspring are not identical is really the key. So as different as you may be from your parents, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. But overall, as far as living things on the planet are concerned, that's really the way to go. And here's why. It comes down to this idea of natural selection, right? That if you've got different kinds of offspring, like we got our little, poor little beetles over here, for whatever reason there's some kind of brownish beetles and a bunch of green beetles, well, if there's a predator around that all of a sudden goes, mmm, green beetles are favorite, all of a sudden those brown beetles are the ones that are going to survive. And they're the ones that are going to be passed on to the next generation. And that's what we kind of see over here, is that we start off with a little bit of both. Here's our birds eating all the green ones. And there's more and more brown ones that are left in that next generation, with more and more brown left behind. If, for some reason, a different predator comes in, starts eating the brown ones, well, then the green ones will survive. But if all of those offspring were identical in the first place, every single beetle were green, guess what? Every single beetle would be dead. And probably delicious as far as the birds were concerned. So because of natural selection, because of the fact that the world is an ever-changing place, things have been changing through billions and billions and billions of years. There is no one set of rules, one ecology, one predator, one prey. That because things change, variation in the long run is actually what provides species the, I don't know, differences to be able to cope with all of those unseen, you know, circumstances that could come up uh, through the future. So these last couple slides here, I'll talk about different ways that variation is built into sexual reproduction and, and meiosis in particular. So these first couple here that you've, you probably recognize, this one about combining two gametes. The simple fact that you've got two sets of genes coming together uh, and the independent assortment that's associated with creating those two gametes is a huge part of variation. You don't look like one parent or the other parent. You look a little bit like a blend of both. I mean, you may resemble more, one more than the other, but you've got some of the genes from both sides, and that makes you truly unique. And may have, you may have some characteristics that neither one of them have. A second thing that comes along, and a big takeaway from this, so please make sure you take notes in this part, is this process called crossing over. In the last video, we talked about the fact that via independent assortment alone, you could have uh, 2 to the 23rd, um, 8 or 70 billion or something like that, no, 8 million different eggs that could be produced, or 8 million different kinds of sperm. And in reality, it's actually much higher than that. The craziness is that your chromosomes, every time they come together in meiosis, when they form these tetrads, and you can kind of see it in this middle picture right here, when they form these tetrads, they don't just sit there. They literally break off chunks and recombine with the other one. So you can see this one right here, that part of the light green one and part of the dark green one have literally switched which chromatid they're on. And this happens all the time. It may not even just happen once per chromosome. It may happen two, three, four times per homologous pair of chromosomes. And it happens every time that cells come into tetrads. It's crazy to think that variation is so important that your cells risk losing chunks or somehow not doing this process correctly, all in the name of just that chance that maybe something better will happen. So, as you can see down here, even from these two chromatids where we'd expect there'd only be one and two possible chromosomes or possible gametes that could be produced, now because of crossing over, we actually have four um, and probably even more than that. Um, so that means that now it really isn't two to the 23rd different eggs or sperm they could produce. It's much higher than that, probably another exponent or two higher than that in terms of variation. So just an incredible, incredible amount of variation just built into the gamete production process.
furthermore, we can talk about errors, uh, quote unquote errors, right? Um, non disjunction polyploidy. Non disjunction is when, and you remember this from karyotypes, one chromosome plus or minus. Um, polyploidy is a little bit different. Polyploidy is a whole set extra, um, which is kind of crazy. Um, so we talked about non disjunction. I'm not going to go into it here, but things like Down syndrome, uh, the things like having extra X's and Y's, that kind of stuff, usually isn't an advantage, but you know, never know. Maybe it is. Polyploidy, though, in plants at least, does seem to provide an advantage, and this is crazy to me, that these kind of creatures, really common everyday things that you guys know and love, are actually made from organisms that have a very bizarre number of chromosomes. Seedless bananas, which all bananas are, and seedless watermelon are actually triploid. They're 3N. They had an egg that was 2N and a sperm that was N to come together, and that's how they can kind of reproduce them without them being... Um, having seeds in them, kind of a weird bit, but those are all uh, triploid. Uh, this uh, giant strawberry, I mean, look the size of its hand. That strawberry is like the size of your face. Um, that's actually probably tetraploid, four full sets of chromosomes in that. And what we find is that when, um, and you'll see this term down here, colchicine. The colchicine is just a chemical that you can actually squirt on uh, cells that are trying to do mitosis, um, or meiosis, sorry, and um, it can hand, and let's see, Colchicine causes the spindle fibers to not uh, work correctly. And so it's really easy to produce uh, polyploid cells, uh, especially in plants this way. And it turns out in plants that polyploid plants tend to be bigger than wild-type plants, than your typical diploid plants. So, again, it could be something that's um, a pretty uh, neat thing in plants. We don't see it in animals at all. But non-disjunction disorders and polyploidy um, could be key events in, say, creating new species uh, in ways that, um, that, like, for example... Humans have 46 chromosomes and chimpanzees have 48. There may have been a non-disjunction thing way back when, I mean, before we were separate species, that may have caused our two species then to sort of branch off in different directions. Furthermore, um, there are uh, ways that even within this whole process, new combinations can come up. Uh, you guys know the term mutation. That's not an unusual term in English today. A mutation is simply new DNA, new changes, um, not something new created necessarily, but maybe a new arrangement or a slightly different difference to it. So, for example, our, our little dog slides there, or uh, the funky carrots up there, the parakeets down there with their crazy colors. Those are all just the results of mutations that, as a result then of, of selective breeding on our part, we're then kind of allowing those mutations to really kind of stand on their own. And especially with dogs, you know, we've, we've gone out of our way to find new mutations and really celebrate those mutations, and we call those new dog breeds. Um, same thing with our carrots, these new purple and yellow carrots. This was simply a mutation that appeared in a normal orange carrot. Someone said, oh, that's cool. Um, let's see if we can make more of those, and let's see if we can continue that mutation. Um, and sometimes those um, mutations are at the level of DNA, literally within the DNA itself. Sometimes it could be, like, within the whole chunks of chromosomes. So we talked about crossing over. Sometimes crossing over doesn't go right, and you get chunks that are inverted. You can see this little piece of, of DNA here is kind of upside down, or that uh, a piece from one chromosome can get kind of attached to a different chromosome. And this could be further uh, types of variation uh, that, can, that can change how genes are expressed or change uh, the arrangements of genes. So finally, what are the things you need to kind of take away from this? Um, number one, asexual reproduction does have its advantages. Um, when the environment is stable, Asexual reproduction, like mitosis, is very simple, it's low energy, it's guaranteed success. Um, you know that those offspring are going to be just like that functional parent, whether that parent was a muscle cell or a whole independent living uh, bacterium, for example. But there's limitations to it, and that's when the environment's changing specifically. And Earth has been changing for millions and millions of years, and it still is changing. So sexual reproduction then really takes on um, a strong role. The variation, the variability, just the simple fact that the offspring are different than the parents is really what makes sexual reproduction and the process of meiosis and fertilization so powerful for life on Earth, especially when the environment is changing and you never know when new things are going to happen. Having offspring that are different may or may not be advantageous. You know, a lot of times mutations are harmful um, or simply not successful. But the simple fact of being able to have variations and just maybe that a species doesn't go all extinct because it didn't have that variation, that's advantageous to life. That's advantageous to species, and it is built into the system at every single level. 
So if you want to look at a four, um, you can do some research into organisms that maybe switch their reproductive patterns, go from asexual to sexual. Uh, you could talk about um, how bacteria actually can achieve sexual reproduction. Or you can look at some things that have some other unusual reproductive patterns. Please use safe Google searching if you're going to look for that one. I don't want that kind of stuff, okay? Uh, and again, link it back to that idea of when, why, how. You want to use this in new and interesting way. I hope you enjoyed today's lesson. A little bit of humor there. See you in class tomorrow.